Hello everyone. For my research presentation, I decided to focus on contemporary artist Jonathan Hobbin and his penchant for producing art photography widely considered to be taboo. I titled my presentation Jonathan Hobbin, A Morbid Reality, because in my perspective, he is confronting the morbid reality of the society we live in today. This is a photo of Jonathan Hobbin, surrounded by child models used in his photographs. Some of the children he uses are paid child models who work professionally, while others are the children of his friends. Born in 1979 in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, Hobbin has grown up to become a controversial figure in Canada and abroad due to the nature of his work. Despite how polarizing his work may be, he is an award-winning artist who is exhibited internationally. His two photo series, In the Playroom from 2010 and Cry Babies from 2015 are probably his most noteworthy series of works. Well, I have yet to show any of the said controversial works by Hobbin. This is purposeful, as I want to take away some of the immediate shock value of his photos, so they can be discussed from a more academic viewpoint. This is not to say one should not be shocked and potentially offended by what they see, but hopefully given context, the shock won't overtake the ability to objectively assess his work. That being said, my working thesis is that Jonathan Hobbin plays off of society's macabre fascination with catastrophe and utilizes child models in his photographs to deliver an impactful social critique to those who view his work. In this presentation, I hope to justify this through examining Hobbin's works as well as other contemporary artists whose works may be considered controversial or to have shock value to the everyday viewer. This photo is titled A Boo Grave and is part of Hobbin's 2010 photo series called In the Playroom. This is the image by Hobbin that grabbed my attention in the Rosen textbook and sent me down this research path. In this image, three children are engaged in a sick and twisted playtime that one would hope to never find their ch child playing. On the left, surrounded by various Halloween ornaments, is a young girl dressed as a U.S. soldier, smoking a cigarette, and pointing her finger gun at her other playmates. In the middle of the image, behind an ashtray overflowing with cigarette butts, is a child standing on a box pedestal, and they appear to be connected to a power socket via wire taped to their hand. They are standing with their arms splayed like a Christ figure and dressed in a ragged black shawl and a, with a hood covering their face. To the right is a young boy with only his underwear on. He is handcuffed, but pulls his arms up to cover his ears, his face contorted in a scream. A stuffed dog clings to his waist, and there appears to be blood on his leg. <coughs> Excuse me. This image is shocking. The playroom is supposed to be a safe space for children, and the scene unfolding is certainly anything but. But maybe that's the point, that in today's media-driven society and 24-hour news cycle, it is impossible for these images and situations to escape the knowledge of children. How do children internalize and cope with topics like the Abu Ghraib prison torture when the news put on by their parents sensationalizes such events? What is the point of the sick fascination with tragedy that has captivated society as a whole anyway? Here are three images from the same 2010 In the Playroom photo series. To the left is an image called White Nights. To the top right is Spring Break. And at the bottom right is The Saints. All three images see children in the same scenario of the playroom as a boo game. But each focuses on different tragedies that were the objects of intense media intention. White Nights 
sees a child dressed as Jim Jones, the leader of the People's Temple cult that saw over 900 people die in a mass suicide. The child prepares Kool-Aid, which was the agent of their suicide, while the dolls and stuffed animals strewn around the ground represent the bodies of the dead. Spring Break is a reference to the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, an 18-year-old who, while on her senior trip to senior class trip to Aruba, disappeared. Though with the body not found, even with three viable suspects, there has been no resolution to the case. The three boys surrounding the child dressed as a cheerleader wear shirts with references to the case and are stand-in for her alleged killers. The Saints sees three very young black children playing in a pool, wearing FEMA floaties, and the child in the forefront wears a tank top alluding to the Louisiana Saints football team. These clues lead the image to be understood as critiquing FEMA's response to Hurricane Katrina. Robin then returned in 2015 with his portrait series, Cry Babies. This series sees lone children in stereotyped costumes in situations photographed in the traditional Victorian portrait style. The image on the left, Scout's Honor, shows a young boy crying while wearing his Scout's uniform and reapplying smudged red lipstick. The styling of the child alludes to him as being a victim of Boy Scout childhood sex abuse scandal. And the purpose of the image is to explore one of the different facets that compromise childhood loss of innocence. The image on the left, an honest engine, is of a native child dressed in a stereo stereotyped American Indian garb, crying and smoking a cigarette. This child has lost their innocence due to early exposure to racist stereotyping. After viewing the previous images, do you believe that Jonathan Hobbins' aim is to act as a provocateur through his work? Or is he trying to tackle the monumental concept of collective grief? I think it is probably a little bit of both, as images such as the twins, seen below, are clearly going to stir controversy due to the choice of topic and his use of children as subjects. More importantly, I believe these images start conversations about the subject of the photos as well as the impact it has on children. I remember in childhood, my parents speaking on these topics as though I did not understand or would not remember. But I do, and I wonder how this plays into my mindset as an adult. Diana Thornycraft, another contemporary Canadian artist, utilizes children's toys and figures in her installations and sculptures that confront some of the most distasteful incidents in American and Canadian history. This installation, titled Quintland, from her A People's History collection, is a commentary on the zoo-like treatment of the Dion quintuplets, born in 1934 in Ontario, Canada. After birth, the five girls were taken from the custody of their parents and were made wards of the crown. In this process, the crown turned the girls into a tourist trap, with them put out daily into a playground designed as a public observation stop. In hindsight, the research and animalistic treatment of the girls is considered highly unethical and would be unlikely to occur today. Tom Forsyth, a contemporary American artist born in 1958, is most famous for the controversy surrounding his 1999 series, Food Chain Barbie, that saw the famous doll in various precarious situations involving kitchen appliances to comment on the consumerism associated with the figure of Barbie. The image shown here, Malted Barbie, is an example of just that. The toy maker behind Barbie, Mattel, sued Forsyth in an attempt to censure the works. But Forsyth came out on top in the case, winning the lawsuit in the name of free speech. 
after seeing works from Hobbin and others like Thornycraft and Forsyth, I believe collectively that their works produce more good than harm. Allowing the public to tackle the taboo of admitting we live in a, ma in a news doom cycle. The value of these controversial works lie within their ability to open one's